average American now carries 23 extra pounds. Heart disease and stroke will claim the lives of 460,000 American women. 69 grams of fat. You could actually save 12 grams of the fat and half the calories if you simply ate an entire stick of butter. We're talking about diabetes and hypertension and bone diseases, osteoporosis. Prostate cancer is now the most common cancer in American men. Doctors say we really need to eat less red and processed meat. On arteriosclerosis and cancer and autoimmune disease. We have unprecedented amount of type 2 diabetes in our children and we're starting to see hypertension in our children in grammar school. In case you're wondering, 2,120 calories. Clearly, the Western diet is taking a toll. This should serve as a wake-up call. We have a growing problem, and the ones who are growing are us. During the 1960s, heart disease was on the rise in the U.S. What doctors commonly call coronary artery disease is usually caused by a condition of the arteries that supply the heart with blood. What happens is that over time, a fatty substance in the bloodstream called cholesterol builds up in the coronary arteries, restricting the blood flow to the heart. This can ultimately cause several problems, from severe chest pain called angina to heart attacks. Cholesterol is a natural substance produced by all animals, including humans, and it's an essential component of our cell's walls. But when we consume dietary cholesterol, which is only found in animal foods like meat, eggs, and dairy products, it tends to stay in the bloodstream. This so-called plaque is what collects on the inside of our blood vessels and is the major cause of coronary artery disease. Today, over 500,000 Americans go under the knife annually for heart bypass surgery, costing around $100,000 a piece these operations alone constitute a staggering total of nearly $50 billion. Shortly afterward, Dr. Campbell came across a scientific paper published in a little-known Indian medical journal. It detailed work that had been done on a population of experimental rats that were first exposed to a carcinogen called aflatoxin, then fed a diet of casein, the main protein found in milk. They were testing the effect of protein on the development of liver cancer they used two different levels of protein. They used 20% of total calories, and then they used a much lower level, 5%. 20% turned on cancer, 5% turned it off. This Indian paper, together with what Dr. Campbell had learned about increased liver cancers in children eating animal-based foods, combined to create a decisive moment in his work and his life. Because we learned that animal protein was really good in turning on cancer. On the front lines of this new war was Caldwell Esselstyn. By 1978, he was chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force at the Cleveland Clinic. Yet he soon began to doubt the medical procedures he was using. No matter how many of these operations I was doing for women for breast cancer, I wasn't doing one single thing for the next unsuspecting victim. So Dr. Esselstyn started investigating the global statistics on breast cancer. One of the facts he discovered was that the incidence of breast cancer in Kenya was far lower than it was in the United States. In fact, in 1978, the chances of a woman getting breast cancer in Kenya were 82 times lower than in the US. Dr. Esselstyn was even more surprised by the numbers he discovered for some other types of cancer. In the entire nation, of Japan in 1958. How many autopsy proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate? 18. 18 in the entire nation. That to me was about the most mind-boggling public health figure that I, I think I'd ever encountered. In the same year, the U.S. population was only about twice the size of Japan's. Yet the number of prostate cancer deaths exceeded 14,000. Dr. Esselstyn also discovered that in the early 1970s, the risk for heart disease in rural China was 12 times lower than it was in the US. And in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, heart disease was rarely encountered. The link he noted between all the areas he studied was simple. 
Virtually, the Western diet was non-existent. They had no animal products. They had no dairy, no meat. Even more compelling to Esselstyn was some historical data that had long been overlooked. In World War II, the Germans occupied Norway. Among the first things they did was confiscate all the livestock and farm animals to provide supplies for their own troops. So the Norwegians were forced to eat mainly plant-based foods. Now we look at the deaths in Norway, just antecedent to this period, from heart attack and stroke. 1927, 1930, 35, look at right up here, right at the very top, 1939. Bingo! In come the Germans, immediately, 1940, wow, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. Have we ever seen a population have their cardiovascular disease plummet like this from statins, from bypass surgery, or from stents? No. But look what immediately happened. With the cessation of hostilities in 1945, back comes the meat, back comes the dairy, Back comes the strokes and heart attacks. I mean, it's such an absolute powerful lesson. But uh, we didn't get it. Because of evidence like this, Dr. Esselstyn was making the same assessment that Dr. Campbell was due to his work in the Philippines. Seeing a causal link between animal-based foods and some of our most deadly diseases. But they weren't the only researchers coming to this conclusion. Another was Dr. John McDougall. In the mid-1970s, he began practicing on a sugar plantation in Hawaii. What uh, I observed there was the health of the people differed dramatically depending upon how long they'd been in Hawaii. People who were raised in Japan, the Philippines, Korea, China, first generation, who had moved from their native land, were always trim, never had heart disease, prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, never overweight. They were in their 80s and 90s and fully functional. Their kids got a little fatter, a little sicker. Their grandkids and the next generation were just as fat and sick as anybody I'd ever seen. And what came through clearly was the diet was the difference. The first generation had learned a diet of rice and vegetables in their native land. But the kids, they started to give up the rice and replace it with the animal foods, the, the dairy products, the meats. And the results were obvious. They got fat and sick. So I knew at that point what caused most diseases. At the time, however, Campbell and Esselstyn knew virtually nothing about this other information. Even so, they ultimately reached a revolutionary conclusion that many of our most crippling conditions could be greatly reduced, if not completely eradicated, simply by eating what they call a whole foods, plant-based diet. This means consuming foods that come mainly from whole, minimally refined plants, such as fruits, vegetables, grains, and legumes. It also means avoiding animal-based foods, such as meat, dairy, and eggs, as well as processed foods, like bleached flour, refined sugars, and oil. Campbell and Esselstyn's research in this field would change their lives forever. Just like the Indian researchers, Campbell fed half the rats in his study a diet of 20% casein, the main protein in dairy products. The other half was fed only 5% casein. Over the 12 weeks of the study, the rats eating the higher protein diet had a greatly enhanced level of early liver cancer tumor growth. On the other hand, all of the rats eating only 5% protein had no evidence of cancer whatsoever. But Dr. Campbell decided to take these findings a step further. This time, instead of keeping his test rats on the same diet throughout the study, he kept them in one group and switched their diets back and forth, between 5 and 20 percent dairy protein, doing so at three-week intervals. The results were astonishing. Whenever the rats were fed 20 percent protein, early liver tumor growth exploded. But when the same rats were given 5 percent protein, tumor growth actually went down. I mean, this was so provocative, this information. We could turn on and turn off cancer growth just by adjusting the level of intake of that protein. Going from 5% to 20% is within the range of American experience. The typical studies on chemical carcinogens causing cancer are testing chemicals at levels maybe three or four orders of magnitude higher than we experience. 
Even more surprisingly, Dr. Campbell discovered that a 20% diet of plant proteins from soybeans and wheat did not promote cancer. <laughs> However, there's a long-standing belief among the public that animal protein is important for human health. A significant collaboration was born. This is the Atlas of Cancer Mortality uh, in China. Published in 1981, the Cancer Atlas was the result of Zhou and Lai's nationwide study. It showed a highly unusual geographical distribution of different types of cancer in China, which tended to be clustered in certain hot spots. The same was true with cancer after cancer, and the counties with the highest levels were often far greater than the counties with the lowest levels. So, for example, esophageal cancer, according to this cancer map, the mortality has 400-fold difference among different counties in China. That's huge. Yeah, and in, I understood in the United States, only several-fold difference. Uh, maybe, not, not may, even. maybe twofold is another, <laughs> that's yeah. all we see. Yeah, yeah. So that caught our uh, attention in terms of the why. Because they are all Chinese. Genetically, they are all the same. And why they have so much difference in single cancer mortality. So we believe it has to be related to the environment, the big environment. And from our professional perspective, of course, it's diet and the nutrition. Dr. Chen and I he said, you know, why don't we just go there and do a study? For Dr. Campbell, it was the opportunity he'd been looking for. Among other things, he could examine how his observations about liver cancer in Filipino children and the findings from his lab studies applied to a large human population. The project would consider 367 diet and health-related variables, making it one of the most ambitious nutritional studies ever conceived. Dr. Campbell and his associates carefully chose 65 counties scattered across China. These counties were mainly located in rural or semi-rural areas. We use the rural counties because they are stable in their residents and they have been in this lifestyle for at least 20 to 30 years. More than 350 workers were trained. They carefully surveyed the diet and lifestyle of 6,500 people in the chosen counties. Urine and blood samples were also taken. In 1983, Drs. Campbell, Chen, and their collaborators began to analyze the vast amount of information that had been collected. The job would take years. In 1990, following nearly a decade of intense effort, Dr. Campbell and his colleagues finally published their China study. It identified no less than 94,000 correlations between diet and disease. Those are big numbers for any study. And in the end of the day, when we did all these correlations in this book here, and we looked at the number of them that were statistically significant, it was between about eight to 9,000. When you have that large number of correlations and you start analyzing each one, if it works out as statistically significant, this means that if 19 out of 20 are pointing in the same direction, it's highly significant and likely to be true. Hundreds of detailed tables and charts were included in the study. Each one presented the raw data that was collected. Then, this information was cross-referenced in multiple ways to demonstrate its reliability and to show how it linked with the 367 variables the study examined. I think the major message we got out of all these coloration analysis uh, is only one message. The plant food-based diet, mainly cereal grains, vegetables and the fruits and the very little animal food is always associated with the lower mortality of certain cancers, stroke and the coronary heart disease. The New York Times called it the most comprehensive large study ever undertaken of the relationship between diet and the risk of developing disease. For Dr. Campbell, he finally had large-scale data on people and it was remarkably consistent with his earlier discoveries. Together, he found that the scientific evidence was clear. 
whole plant-based foods were beneficial to human health, while animal-based foods were not. While Dr. Campbell was publishing his China study, Dr. Esselstyn was getting some powerful data from the research he'd started in 1985. He began with 24 patients, but six had dropped out in the first year, leaving him with a total of 18. At the end of five years, we had uh, follow-up angiograms and 11 of the group had halted their disease. There was no progression. And there were four where we had rather exciting evidence of regression of disease. These results were astonishing. The diet produced something that medication and surgery never had before, actual reversals of heart disease. The biological mechanism that caused these reversals centers on the lining of our veins and arteries, the endothelial cells. They are the absolute life jackets of our blood vessels. You're young and you're a teenager, you're healthy, you could spread those out one layer thick and you'd have something that would cover six or eight tennis courts. In 1988, scientists discovered that endothelial cells manufactured the gas nitric oxide. Well, what does nitric oxide do? Nitric oxide keeps our blood flowing smoothly without being sticky. It also helps to dilate constricted blood vessels during physical activity and inhibits the formation of plaque. And most importantly, nitric oxide is a powerful force for eliminating the inflammation that seems to go with this plaque. However, scientific tests have demonstrated that when we start eating the typical Western diet, our endothelial cells are damaged. When you're getting to be in your 40s and 50s and 60s and you've been slaughtering your endothelial cells. You don't have those six or eight tennis courts. You may be down to one and a half or two, and they can't protect you. Yet according to Dr. Esselstyn, when we begin eating a whole foods, plant-based diet, the damage to our endothelial cells not only stops, it starts to reverse. For decades, the dairy industry and U.S. government have been saying that milk is good for our bones. While all whole foods contain calcium, an essential nutrient for bone health, it is argued that we need the higher amounts found in dairy. Children and aging women in particular have been singled out to drink more and more and more milk. What do you think the most important nutrient we get from dairy products is like milk? Calcium. 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 Or calcium. Calcium. The science in terms of dairy's role in, in healthy bones is pretty strong. And in fact, the National Osteoporosis Foundation, of course, utilizes that science in their recommendations. Osteoporosis is a degenerative bone disease, which has been widely linked to a lack of calcium. If this is true, nations with a high intake of dairy products which are a major source of calcium in a westernized diet, should have low levels of osteoporosis. But according to a study done by a distinguished Harvard researcher, nations with high levels of calcium intake tend to have high levels of hip fractures, which is a key indicator for osteoporosis. And so in fact, the higher the dairy consumption, the higher the rate of osteoporosis, exactly the opposite of what the dairy industry has been telling us for so long. One of the primary mechanisms for that is that animal protein tends to create an acid-like condition in the body called metabolic acidosis. To combat this condition, the body draws upon its most readily available acid buffer, namely calcium in our bones. As the calcium is extracted to neutralize the excess acid, our bones are weakened. Dr. Neil Barnard is a medical researcher and president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Well, the problem is when, when a kid is pulling his tray down the school lunch line, you see federal policies in action. There are burgers topped with cheese, the milk is heavily subsidized, but the vegetables and fruits, a little bit harder to find. And this is because the government contracts are going to particularly the meat producers and, and other producers as well. It has nothing to do with the health of the children. It has all to do with the financial health of the big agribusiness entities. What we have with the USDA is it's really a farmer's advocacy organization. And okay, let's have one. 
but that same group cannot advocate for farmers, help subsidize their operations, manage commodity foods, subsidize the price of growing things, and then turn around and say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna tell people what to eat. They're gonna tell people what to eat based on their constituents, which are the farmers, not the American public. In 1998, Barnard's group sued the USDA. Every five years, the government reformulates the dietary guidelines for Americans. That's the blueprint of what Americans are supposed to eat to be healthy. And we looked at the panel that pulled it together, 11 people. Six of the 11 had financial relationships with the food industry. So we said, hey, wait a minute. There are laws about what they're supposed to do and how transparent they are supposed to be. They violated those. And we brought them to court. And it was a long trial, but we won. But that doesn't change the fact that the policies they came up with continue to favor industry as they always have. Dr. Campbell paid a price for changing his views. He's been marginalized by key administrators of his own university. This after being a lead scientist and securing millions of dollars in research grants for Cornell's Nutritional Sciences Division. He had a popular nutrition course canceled by the division director, who had long been a major consultant to the dairy industry. Numerous observers feel this was an arbitrary decision that violated the standards of academic freedom. The food choices we make have profound global effects. It takes over 10 times the amount of energy from fossil fuels to produce a calorie of animal-based food than it does to produce a calorie of plant food. Since the 1970s, 20% of the Amazon's rainforest has been destroyed. That's an area the size of California. 80% of this cleared land is now occupied by livestock. The world's cattle alone eat enough grain to feed 8.7 billion people, nearly 2 billion more than the population on Earth. With almost a billion malnourished people across the globe, redirecting even a portion of the grain used to fatten cattle could feed every hungry mouth on the planet. For Gene Bauer, factors like these, combined with a deep respect for animals, helped convince him to adopt a plant-based diet. Mr. Bauer is president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary near Watkins Glen, New York. It provides a safe haven for animals that have been abandoned or abused. I grew up eating animals, like most people in our country, uh, but once I started considering my food choices, I recognized that I didn't really want to eat animals. And the more I learned, the more I saw that I was healthier if I didn't eat, didn't eat animals and that I had a much lighter footprint on our planet. The livestock industry is a greater contributor to global warming than the entire transportation industry, according to the United Nations. So by eating meat, milk, and eggs the way we are, we're harming our own health, we're slaughtering 10 billion innocent animals every year in the U.S., and we're destroying the planet. Statistics compiled from the United Nations and the World Health Organization demonstrate the profound global effect that diet has on health. These are the estimated amounts of animal foods produced in nine countries, a figure that's closely related to animal food consumption. These are the numbers of deaths due to heart disease and cancer in the same countries. In the United States, the very same diseases continue to have a grave impact. Even with the billions of dollars spent on cardiac treatment, heart disease is still the number one cause of death, killing over 600,000 people a year. You have two choices. You can eat yourself into poor health and early death, or you can eat yourself into good health and a long, healthy life. And that role is on a plant-centered dietary pattern. You know, I know of nothing else in medicine that can come close to what a plant-based diet can do. I can say there's a great deal of confidence that our national authorities are simply excluding this concept of nutrition from the debate and the discussion in order to protect the status quo. In theory, if everyone were to adopt this, I really believe we could cut healthcare costs by 70 to 80 percent. That's amazing. And it all comes from understanding nutrition, applying nutrition, and just watching the results. The greatest gift that you could possibly give to yourself 
and your family, not only those in your generation, but your children and your grandchildren, if you can make them be aware of the incredible power that resides within each of them to avoid life's most poignantly tragic and painful events, you just don't have to have those kinds of events. Well, I believe it with all my heart, if anyone listened to this, and they really should look at their refrigerator and look at their diet and give a try. You lose weight and you'll be healthier. Nothing could lose if you just take a few weeks and try. You could see how easy it is. I'm not going to say it was difficult. Again, I made up my mind. This is what I'm going to do. I never felt like I wasn't getting what I wanted. So I didn't have ice cream. So I didn't have the donuts. So I ate something else. I can thank them in every way I can think possible, and my doctor especially, Matt, when they just can't understand what it's done to change my life. And it really has, not just mine, my family's, everybody's. It gives me shivers talking about it because it's so serious. It's a life-changing experience. You can be in control. And I stress this because there's so many things going on in my life that I'm not in control of. And that's my message. You can't control your outcome of your body. Eat to live and don't live to eat. What happens in slaughterhouses is a variation on the theme of the exploitation of the weak by the strong. More than 10,000 times a minute, in excess of 6 billion times a year, just in the United States, Life is literally drained from so-called food animals. For beef, the animals are all branded. In this instance, on the face. Dehorning usually follows, never with anesthetic. In transportation, animals are packed so tightly into trucks, they are practically on top of one another. Heat, freezing temperatures, fatigue, trauma, and health conditions will kill some of these animals en route to the slaughter. Eventually, milking cows, like this one, collapse from exhaustion. Normally, cows can live as long as 20 years, but milking cows generally die within four at which point their meat is used for fast food restaurants. At this slaughterhouse, the branded and dehorned cattle are brought into a stall. The captive bolt gun, which was designed to reduce animals unconscious without causing pain, fires a steel bolt that is powered by compressed air or a blank cartridge right into the animal's brain. Though various methods of slaughter are used, in this Massachusetts facility, the cattle is hoisted up and his or her throat is slit. Along with the meat, their blood will be used as well. Though the animal has received a captive bolt to the head, which is supposed to have rendered him or her senseless, as you can see, the animal is still conscious. This is not uncommon. 
Sometimes they are still alive even after they have been bled and are well on their way down the assembly line to be butchered. 